pick in. Um, so we, we you know, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're ready. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for those of you who are joining us here in person. And I know we have quite a few people who are joining online too. So thank you for being here for our final installment of public health speaker series for the spring semester. I definitely want to uh, make an acknowledgement that this is co-hosted by Here and Next through the provost's office. And um, I would like to give a special shout out to Jonesy Johnson, who just is shutting the door and walking away. <laughs> um, but I would like um, for all, all of us to give her a great big round of applause for all the hard work that she puts into organizing these through the year. Thank you so much, Jonesy. Okay, my name is Angela Hobson and I serve as the Associate Dean uh, for Public Health here at the Brown School. And I have the distinct honor to introduce our um, guests for today. And we're gonna do things a little bit differently. Um, we have our guest who I will introduce in just a moment. Um, he is gonna give us a talk and then we're gonna have a fireside chat portion of this talk um, that will be facilitated with Dr. Daryl Hudson. So I have the distinct honor of introducing both of our, our speakers. I'll first start with Dr. Hudson. He is a professor here at the Brown School and his research focuses on the racial and ethnic health disparities and the role of social determinants of health, particularly how socioeconomic position and social context affect health and health disparities. He has examined perceptions of depression and mental health care among African Americans and investigated comorbid depression and type 2 diabetes in various settings. He directs the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Equity at Washington University, and he also co-directs the Collaboration on Race, Inequality, and Social Mobility in America within the Brown School Center for Social Development. He holds a joint appointment with the Washington University Department of Psychiatry, and he's a faculty scholar with the Institute of Public Health. Prior to his faculty appointment, Dr. Hudson completed a postdoctoral fellowship with the Kellogg Health Scholars Program at the University of California at San Francisco, Berkeley. So thank you, Dr. Hudson, for being here today to um, engage in our public health speaker series. And, and now I have the honor of introducing our guest, Dr. Ryan Petaway. He is a public health scholar, educator, and poet who integrates social epidemiology, participatory research, and creative arts to advance health equity. He engages critical Okay. <laughs> he engages critical Black feminist and decolonial theory and methods to pursue procedural and epistemic justice and advance anti-racist pra praxis within public health research practice, including um, via satire and humor, music, and poetry. Central to this work are considerations of structural racism, white supremacy, and settler colonialism as germane to matters of misrepre re misrepresentation and narrative power within public health research, practice, and pedagogy. His applied research integrates social epidemiology and CBPR and YPAR to improve empirical and conceptual under understandings of place and health. This includes the development of a STEAM-based high school curriculum program with youth of color focused on social determinants of health, participatory research, and creative arts, something called Why Heart PDX, the Youth Health Equity and Action Research Training Program, which I think we may hear more about. Um, core to this collaborative work is centering poetry as both a legit legitimate form of knowledge, acquisition, and expression, and as indispensable an indispensable mode of healing and resistance for youth of color to counter dominant narratives. So with that, please help me welcome Dr. Ryan Petaway. Thank you. I thought I was gonna like walk around and dance around, but I don't have a mic on me. So I'm gonna stand right here the entire time. I hope that's all right. Um, move this a little bit closer. I'm almost done with my coffee. That's good for y'all. So it'll be, it'll be a better talk. Um, thanks for uh, the introduction um, and again for the invitation to speak and uh, share space with y'all. Um, hopefully by now you've had a chance to read what's on uh, the screen here. Uh, for folks that are virtual, I hope you can see it. I hope you got the tech right. Um, yeah, I think uh, I titled this talk and I titled a lot of my talks. I center a lot of my work 
uh, based on this passage from, from Bell Hooks, Black Feminist Scholar. I think so often when we think, think about um, any type of scholarship or research on anybody in any margin or the intersections of multiple margins, we're trained and conditioned to think about that margin or those margins only as sites and sources of pain and harm and suffering, deficits and depletion, right? Um, the hooks talks about is like that margin, our margins, our multiple margins are also sites of power and resistance and a uh, radical possibility in the imagination, right? Um, that's what's missing from our training in public health. I don't, I'm not assuming everyone in here is in public health, but that's the, the, the field that I'm in and close to. And I would say that that's a, it's a fundamental issue for, for if we're being serious about anti-racism, we can't possibly be anti-racist if we're not embracing this idea that the margin is not just a site of pain and suffering. Um, margin and marginality are not synonymous, right? Um, and I think for me, um, I can't give a talk without thinking about this. Um, okay, so hopefully this is good to go now. Let's click here, okay. Uh, and then also this simple thing here, if you can read this, uh, I am evidence. Uh, a lot of public health, we're, uh, we're trained to pursue and get bigger data, better science, more evidence, more this, more that, more that, as if there's this magical threshold of papers or this perfect regression we're gonna run one day, that's the thing that's gonna save us. And then it's not, you know this, I know this. So why do we keep doing this and telling ourselves this lie, right? We don't need more evidence. Everybody in this room that has a story to tell, you are evidence. You don't need anything else uh, to justify or make a claim against or for anything, right? That is an illusion. So that's the title of the talk. Uh, that's who I am. Um, and I'm gonna get this moving because I have about 25 minutes ish, you know, and I'm always up here putting things in slides and talking about theory. I could be up here for uh, 325 minutes. So uh, yes. I'm gonna make sure that uh, we get these chairs and have a conversation with Dr. Hudson. Um, and then I can share these slides, right? There are gonna be some parts where I might just skip over because I go on tangents and everything like that. Um, so uh, I start us off with uh, a little background on theory. I am a professor, so I feel like I can't let y'all walk out of here without giving y'all some type of um, breadcrumbs to follow to get deeper into what I'm talking about in terms of critical theory, decolonial theory, black feminist theory. Um, and this section here, A Litany for Survival, is based off a poem by Audre Lorde. It's National Poetry Month. Uh, we'll be doing a poetry reading later. Uh, hopefully y'all can make it off of that. Um, and this quote here, so it is better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. Um, our silence will not protect us. You've probably heard that quote uh, many, many times. Uh, we have to speak, right? Uh, then I'll go into uh, practice um, in terms of how I've integrated some of these, these thoughts and ideas into my own work. Um, and this, this line here, Ain't Got No, I Got Life, is from a Nina Simone song. Um, if y'all are familiar with Nina Simone in this particular song, it's premised upon this idea, this narrative of the things she's thinking about that she doesn't have based on structural racism, colorism, sexism, right? But then she spins it in the second part of the song and talks about all the things that she does have, right? That's what's missing from our public health stories, right? We only talk about the things we don't have or the things that we're told that we don't have, right? To the point where we forget that we actually still exist, that we're still fully human and we have a whole bunch of other things that are omitted from the public health knowledge canon, right? And I draw from the inspiration from Langston Hughes, another uh, Black poet. Um, and then this third section, My Soul's Intact, also another Nina Simone song from Young, Gifted, and Black. For future scholars uh, and potential educators, practitioners, uh, there's a whole world out there, right? Um, if you go through your entire public health training and you're only seeing that one narrow lens of what our communities at the margins are, you're missing the bigger picture, right? Um, there's a whole world out there and it's up for the current folks, practitioners, scholars, educators, folks like myself to remind y'all and give y'all permission to lean into that. Not that y'all need permission, but that sometimes that's what we think we need. And then I'll close and some inspiration from my one of my favorite Creatives in the world, uh, rest in power, Nipsey Hustle. Um, fuck living basic, I'm taking risks. Fuck what they're saying, I'm saying this. Um, sometimes you just gotta have the audacity um, to say the things. Okay, so first, uh, quickly through Foucault and other F words that you will hear in this talk. Um, we have to talk about power, right? It's amazing to me that y'all can get a training uh, and acquire knowledge to get philosophy degrees in, of knowledge, right? Doctorate degrees and all this stuff, but never have a conversation about what knowledge actually wow. is idea of epistemology, right? And the way that power and epistemology work to shape the knowledge landscape. Um, for me, I think about rep repressive and productive power uh, from Foucault's work and this idea of objects, ritual, and privilege. Uh, the idea that uh, power is used uh, in repressive ways, right? So if you think about what is published or not published in the literature, what is funded or what is not funded, right? Uh, that is a form of repressive power. And productive power is the opposite of that in many ways, right? There are certain things that will be researched to death, right? 
you will read a thousand papers about what's wrong with our communities, right? That is productive power. It creates and produces a narrative, a dominant hegemonic narrative, right? And it also takes up space from alternative narratives, right? So productive and repressive power work in tandem. They're both always continually working together. Part of the way this plays out in public health uh, in terms of objects and ritual and the privilege, uh, the idea is we're producing objects of knowledge, right? We have to go out and create this thing, right? Um, and there are rules for which we do this. You get a grant. Well, first you have to write that grant. Only certain people will give you that grant based on this power knowledge structure, right? Only certain things will get funded, but you have to get this grant. Then you have to do your research and there are certain methods that are seen as more legitimate, right? Usually quantitative reductions, empirical things, right? Um, and then we have to send it to a peer review journal where we just assume that the word peer is a, like, like they're serious. It's like the most unserious use of peer I've ever heard in my life, y'all. Peer review journal. Um, and then those folks have been trained the same way that we have. So they're credentialed, they're trained to see objects. They've been participating in this ritual, right? Um, and then you have to get it published. And if you don't get it published, and if it's not in a top tier, quote unquote, high impact, whatever the fuck that means, journal, um, then it's not real science or knowledge. You haven't, you have no knowledge, no real knowledge that anybody has to listen to, or no real evidence, unless you go through this ritual. And who gets to participate in the ritual? That's the privilege. Folks like myself now, right? As other, like anyone in this room is a part of the privilege on some level because you're in the space to engage in the knowledge uh, process, right? The idea here, though, is there's a certain cross section of the privilege, right? There's a certain set of knowledges and epistemologies that folks and methods that folks have to engage in in order to prove themselves. And then once they prove themselves, they become the peer reviewers, right? So we have to go through this gatekeeping process, right? Um, I also draw from uh, Patricia Hill Collins, Black feminist legal scholar's work in terms of her conception of power, but I won't spend time with that uh, this moment because of, you know, I want to sit down and talk with Dr. Hudson. So um, what does this look like in terms of the structure of knowledge production in terms of anti-racism decolonizing in public health, right? Well, this is what it is. Less than 6% of uh, faculty are Black, less than 6% are Latinx, and 0.3% are Indigenous. And that's not an error. I did this math. It's about one Indigenous tenure-track faculty member for every 700 white tenure-track faculty, faculty members on a landmass that was 100% Indigenous folks. That's who our faculty are in our schools of public health nationally. Editorial boards is a similar thing, 77% white, 1% black, 3.8% Latinx, and 88% straight. So if you're a queer woman of color and you're doing research for your margins, your intersecting margins, sending your research off to do this ritual for your peers, do you think you're going to actually find your peers out there to understand where you're speaking from and who you're speaking for? This is a matter of epistemic gaze and epistemic pose, right? Social locations that we, we embody are poles. Mm -hmm. Who are we writing for? Toni Morrison and James Baldwin talked about this, right? This idea that they're tired of writing for this imaginary white man. They have to, they're writing their books so that a white man approves it, right? Imagine having to do your research such that the editorial board members will approve it. Think about the ways in which we compromise our ideas and knowledges and our expressions because we're trying to get it through to satisfy, to appease this dominant editorial gaze. Same thing plays out in NIH, uh, at National Institutes of Health Grant Review Panels. Um, this is the largest source of funding for public health probably on the planet. Someone can fact check me on that. Um, we have so much money wrapped up in this in the U.S. I'm sure other countries have money in this too. But the NIH, uh, which is 98% uh, discretionary funds, which means that they're inherently political. There's no funding for NIH without a political process. So let that marinate for a while. The folks that decide what gets funded for there, also mostly white. 89% um, uh, white, only 11% for under underrepresented backgrounds, right? So if you want to participate in this ritual, it doesn't bode well for us, right? This is how structural racism, settler colonialism plays out within public health. We can talk about racism and settler colonialism out there to study it in housing and transportation and food environments, but our own field is dripping in it. Um, and the future does not look particularly great, um, but I'm going to move on from this slide uh, so I can get to the other things and remind myself that I need to breathe. Um, and drink water. Shout out to Jean Baptiste. So, all of you have read, I don't know, at this point, let me see a show of hands. Uh, public health faculty or staff. Okay. Public health master students. Okay. Public health doctoral students. Is there an undergraduate public health program here? And anybody that's like kind of public health adjacent ish. Okay. 
Got it. Right. Making all these assumptions, right? All of you by now have probably read, uh, I don't know, let's just go with four dozen papers that the last two or three sentences of a paper amount to more, more research is needed. <laughs> um, I'm here to tell you all that it's not. We don't need more research, y'all. This is what MLK was talking about, this mythological concept of time, right? Wait for a more convenient season. That's basically the public health equivalent of like, we need more research. The fuck we don't, like, stop it, right? Um, there will always be one more thing, one more study, one more like sample, one more regression. It's a, it's a facade, y'all. It's, it's fake. It's an illusion, right? This is how racism manifests in our own field. We keep saying we need more things. Says who? We didn't say that about our own communities when we're coming from the margins, right? We didn't say that. I don't think I need more research for the things that I care about. Um, and this reflects this idea from critical race theorists, uh, Zubiri Medina Silva of white logics and white methods, a context in which white supremacy has defined the techniques and processes of reasoning about social facts. It assumes a historical posture that grants eternal objectivity to the views of white elites and condemns the views of non-whites to perpetual subjectivity. They go on to say that things like race, gender, and class are important not only as subjects for investigation, you know, to study them, uh, but as structural factors that partly shape researchers and their scientific gaze, right? That's us. Uh, we're not randomly distributed from some other planet out of an alien ship with a mandate of do this research or die. That's not how we choose our paths, right? We are socially conditioned, right? And we bring that into our, the way we see the world. So if we're not thinking about the way we see the world and how this shapes our pedagogy and our research questions, uh, we're just furthering this idea of white logics and white methods. Um, and they go on to say, I think this is important too. I think sometimes this is why DEI work really ain't shit sometimes because we really think it's just a matter of like representation and numbers. Folks that are going through this process that are from the margins, pe uh, people of color, it's important to understand that like whiteness and um, being racialized as white are not coterminous, right? So you can be a person of color and still be engaging in these same white logics and white methods. And it's almost required of us in these spaces, in these in these spaces, right? Anybody that's been a person of color in a primary white institution going through public health training, you're conditioned. You almost have to prove over and beyond that you can do white methods, white methods and white logics. You have to be better than an actual person who's racialized as white to do this sometimes, right? So we internalize these logics for ourselves and, and are trained to look at our communities the way that the white gaze would have us look at those communities, right? So we're not better off just because we're a person of color doing this work, right? We also have to be critically reflexive of how we're being trained and conditioned. Um, another element that I wanna to touch on quickly here is this idea of commodification within public health, right? The idea that knowledge is a commodity, right? As uh, Linda Smith talks about this in the context of settler colonialism and knowledge is in indigenous communities, minority communities, uh, the ways in which knowledge is basically taken and you, for like indigenous knowledge is erased and then new knowledge is created or knowledge is taken and then sold essentially. It's commodified so some, someone can make money off of it, right? This is very familiar to anybody that's ever gotten a grant, right? We literally make money off of the things we study, right? Uh, I don't know what the fiscal and administrative indirects are here, but I heard that they're like 68% at Michigan. So for context, I don't know if folks have heard this before, but if you get a $10 million grant from the NIH, um, University will take $6 million. They'll get $6 million out of that to use for whatever they want. Uh, when you do health inequalities research or racial health equity research, it's a for-profit. For it's, it's a revenue engine for the university. That's why the universities want you to be writing these grants so it brings them in money. And then with that money, you can pay for your article processing charges, the APCs, to get your research published. So you're making money for your university, and then you're using some of that money to pay for your research to make it out into the world, right? Think about this for a minute. So for me, how is this any different than mining a community for oil or diamonds or gold? This is ex extraction. This extractivist logic, settler colonial, taking data from our communities. We take blood samples from folks in the projects and then sell what, the knowledge that we produce from that to like the elite class, right? Sit on that for a second. Um, and then we regulate that so that we own it for ourselves, right? This idea of the white possessive. It's no longer the, the, the data uh, of the community member who gave their blood or gave their response to a survey question. Now it's pay for access journals. Now it's an NIH data set. Now it's the California health interview survey that you have to pay for and then you have to actually log onto their server to use it, right? It's not even their fucking data. They got the data from the people they interviewed. This is the white possessive. This is settler colonial white supremacist logics manifest in our own field. This is our data. These are our communities. How do we not have access to ourselves? Uh, I suggest that this is a form of epistemic violence and oppression. Um, 
And then at the end of the day, I think it's just, a, it's as simple as this. Our field is structurally racist, period. Question is, what are we gonna do about it? Here, I want y'all to think about your training to date and ask yourselves, have you ever, if you're coming from a margin or multiple margins, have you ever read a research study that said that your margin is dope, that your margin is beautiful? You haven't, because we don't fund that, because we don't care about that. White logics and white supremacists, septic white logics, don't care about anything about our margins, our marginality, unless it's for them to be able to say that we're othered and that we're worse off compared to them, right? The representation we see of ourselves, we can hardly recognize ourselves because every time someone talks about us in the peer-reviewed public health literature, it's talking shit about us. But there's another way forward. Arts, we can make it irresistible. Tony Cave and Barr, right? Uh, arts are good for us. They're good for us individually, mental health, you know, art therapy, y'all can read the literature, and it's good for us collectively, right? Uh, arts are the things that are going to get us up in the morning and get us out in the streets to get us moving to galvanize us, right? Arts are going to allow us to be fully human, to remember that we're actually fully human and not some statistical thing, right? Uh, that's the power of arts for us, right? Um, it allows us a path forward to, excuse me, to engage in what Antonio Gramsci talks about as rearticulation, folks that are familiar with critical race theory, counter storytelling, uh, Bell Hooks' notion of power from the margins, this idea that when we're coming from the margin, or multiple margins, as we move to center uh, to acquire knowledge, right? Now we're in the center, we're at Wash U, right? Um, what's the risk that we lose ourselves here, right? So that when we go back to the margin, are we still the same person? Or have we allowed ourselves to be colonized? And so that now we're perpetuating the same thing that the center was, right? Can we retain our power from the margin? Or are we giving it up when we move to center? Public health critical race practices, I always lift up these things that are highlighted here, social construction of knowledge, intersectionality, disciplinary self-critique, which this talk is just essentially disciplinary self-critique, uh, also voice. Uh, this decolonial notion uh, from uh, Leanne Simpson, generative refusal, uh, that we don't have to accept what we inherited in this field as a default starting point. We can refuse that. Uh, that is more than resistance. Resistance is like, yeah, we're gonna try to stop the thing. Refusal is like, we're not even going to, like, y'all can have that. We don't even want none of that. Y'all keep all that energy for yourselves, right? Uh, what does that mean for us going forward? Uh, and can we move towards resurgent practice, right? Uh, to be deliberately disruptive. Um, and this, for me, is what gets us to epistemic disobedience. Um, turning away from this idea of the zero point epistemology, the zero point being this, uh, this is taken for granted, dominant white gaze, objective, neutral, this is the world according to these logics, right? That's the starting point. We can just like, nah, we don't even need that anymore. Let's disobey that, right? Let's be epistemically disobedient. Um, can we suspend damage center narratives that Eve Tuck, decolonial feminist scholar talks about, right? These narratives that only ask us to share our pain, right? Such that our communities are only represented or cared about, cared about in quotes, if we're talking about what's wrong, right? Can we suspend those damage to the narratives? Can we move away from notions of black geographic peril? I'm a place health scholar. Some of y'all probably seen some GIS maps uh, or even with COVID data, right? What do we do with the maps, right? The most, the worst part of the map is like map red all the time, right? That's the high risk area. That's the dangerous area. Uh, can we stop that dominant narrative of representing our communities as places of geographic peril? Um, can we move toward, towards what Dr. Shanae Birch uh, refers to as helpful narratives? Change the story a little bit. For me, I think this is critical. If we care about health justice, that we say that we care about, I don't see a path forward if we're not starting with epistemic justice. Because we can't possibly do research and data justice if we're not thinking about the epistemology behind our research methods and logics. And if we're not teaching this, then what are we teaching? We're teaching status quo. That's what we're teaching. Like all y'all right now, I'm not throwing no shade on any particular institution. I'm just at this institution today. And another day I'll be at another institution. If we're not teaching this, we're teaching protecting the status quo. We're not being radical. We're not imagining radical possibility or openness. We're literally maintaining the status quo. We're creating technocrats to repeat the same process that has left us where we currently are right now. If y'all are cool with that, keep on paying your tuition. All right, how am I on time? 
I have lost track. Okay, about five minutes? Five ish? Okay. Now it's just more fun things, right? That was fun too for me, anyway. Uh, or maybe it's just the coffee, I don't know. Um, to the poetry things, right? Um, cool. So what I try to do is integrate a lot of those things into my work um, from the beginning. And it's just a paper trail for y'all. I'm not going to spend time on this. Bottom line is I try to move through this framework that I developed called the People Social Epi. As a place health scholar, I think this is where the real power is, right? I'm not really interested in nationally representative things. I care about really trying to focus on what's going on here right now. What can we do about right here, right now, right? Um, and then moving towards something that's more participatory and collaborative, um, and that ultimately is anti-racism decolonizing, and then ultimately allows space for creativity as a, a powerful form of knowledge production and, and way of knowing, right? And so some of this um, is through the Youth Health Equity uh, Action Research Training Program, YHRP PDX, uh, training up high school students to get ready for public health, right? Part of the issue that we have in public health is that the folks kind of stumble upon our field. I bet half of y'all thought y'all were going to go to med school. Like, you didn't even know what public health was until like five days ago, right? Real talk. You, I'm going to be a dentist. I'm going to be like, y'all didn't even want to be public health researchers. Just be honest, right? That's a problem because we get folks in the field that aren't actually here with intention. And when you're not here with intention, you just like swallow up whatever's given to you, right? Um, we need to get folks into this field earlier so they can hold their own space and defend their own claims and not just take what's given to them in their textbook or their syllabus for granted, right? Um, so we're trying to train them up, and we do this through these training modules, uh, participatory methods training, photo voice, activity space mapping, x-ray mapping, and so on, and also engaging creative arts. Um, the first project we did that we ended up having in a little bit early because of COVID, um, you know, they did photo voice, had their photographs, they were uh, writing poems, they created little buttons and things of that nature, and they also customized designed some hoodies. Um, and we had this whole interactive art exhibit plan, but we couldn't host it uh, with the Stope Artistry of Town out there. Um, we had this mannequin idea, like we put the hoodies on the mannequins and then people come in and put pins to, um, you know, physically locate the ways our bodies feel in certain locations that they had documented, right? So it's like this 3D immersive experience of like place embodiment, but, um, but getting visual uh, elements into our work, right? And getting arts into our work, whatever that uh, looks like was the goal of that. And then more recently in the last, I guess, four years now, poetry. Um, and so as a origin story of sorts, right? Um, I'm a huge Nas fan. So memory lane here, right? This is a typical choropleth map of what we do in public health, right? This is from Raj Shetty's work up at Harvard, Opportunity Insights. And what you see here um, is a map of where I went to high school at. And that dark polygon you see is my census tract. Um, and I grew up like right in here in the middle of like these census tracts. Um, basically what this shows is that there was a 0.3% chance that I would be here now, essentially, right? It shows the probability that being low income, the lowest income uh, quintile in the country, being black, and then uh, as, as an adult, being the top income quintile in the country, right? 10%, um, 9.2% of the folks that of my birth cohort, they did this by lining up um, tax, social security, and birth records from the 80s cohort, so I'm an 80s baby. 9% um, of the folks that were born a part of my cohort from this community are in prison or in jail, and only 0.3% of the folks from this community are in the top quintile of income, right? Um, I say that because they had the audacity to do this and talk shit about my neighborhood and they'd never been there. So they got the math wrong, a 0.3% chance. I mean, like y'all, like, like what regression did y'all run? Like y'all messed it up. Like I'm here. Um, Cause they didn't come down and talk to us, right? These are my homies from high school. All of us went to college. Now we might've been the only five or six or seven black males from my high school to go to college, but still we had a squad. Raj Chetty didn't know that because they don't they they had this this dominant white gaze right they didn't come and talk to us right they didn't know how my my pops and my brother right and my brothers they didn't know any of these things there was more in that my community than just the harms there was a lot of love and levity right a lot of resilience if you want to call it that um, so when I wrote a poem my first peer review paper um, that a poem was published in I think it was the first time this happened in the public health literature it got this uh, paper of the year award and they wanted me to record uh, an audio version of it so I had to remember that where it started at. It started with listening to Nas, right? So I created this album art for the song that I, uh, the promo I recorded. It's based on Nas's 94 Illmatic. Um, Cause that's what I was doing. I was sitting on project benches right here doing observational studies of my life, right? Before I even learned how to pronounce the word epidemiology, right? So how was it that I was in public health for so long and I forgot how it started? That I somehow I wasn't doing poetry and music as a part of my scholarship and why couldn't I, right? And in 2020, it was real then, it's still real now, but I wouldn't have survived 2020 without poetry. It was a necessity. There's a litany for my survival, right? Um, 
it was not a luxury. As Padre Lord says, poetry was not a luxury for me in 2020. So I had the audacity to write a poem and try to tell them, like, listen, this is public health scholarship. And they agreed, um, which is great. And then I did my research, you know, back there. And that's my mom right there. Doctoral degree. Go Berkeley. Uh, so the poetry things continued, obviously. I skipped through these things. I put them here because they're important in the sense that I had to uh, publish a paper, get a national, uh, get a paper of the year award, publish another paper, get another paper of the year award, uh, publish another poem, I get a national poetry month prize and a push cart prize nomination before I could write a grant to put poetry in the grant as relevant to public health. Let that sink in for a second. I literally had to go out and do the things on a level before I could actually justify doing that for my own scholarship. And now there's a public health poetry section and the first ever one in a peer reviewed public health journal that y'all can send your poems to. So send us your poems, right? Um, and then quickly here to close out, we do poetry workshops as a part of this project now as well, um, and also poetry competitions, and we're creating chat books for these. Uh, so we're going to be able to have the competitions, put their poems, uh, youth competition with the SCI youth, the same youth that were doing the research, uh, the writing poems and putting them in a chat book, um, and then the workshops. And I'd have to say that the workshops, um, probably the best thing I've ever done in public health space. There, there was so much black joy and love in that room. I'm like, I don't need to evaluate this at all. People are in here healing. They're laughing. Their heart rate is great. You know, and like, you know, like, I don't care about blood. Like, this is great. I don't, I don't need like somebody to come and take a blood sample and be like, yo, like attending three poetry workshops for 14 minutes increases self-efficacy by 4%. I don't care. <laughs> but that's the type of shit that we do. That's white logics in public health, right? It's, in order for them to think this is real public health work, that's what they would want to do to it. They can't just let us be, right? Um, and extending from the poetry project, uh, I wrote a poem in International Journal of um, Epidemiology uh, that I formed as a bar chart. And this is kind of the inspiration for this theme that we have, this annual event we have every year for National Poetry Month uh, of stats and stanzas. And so we bring in the poetry contest winners from the youth organizations. Uh, self enhancement Inc., which is a black youth organization in Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, uh, which is Asian Pacific Islander organization. And the poets come in and we invite featured poets and we do a thing and it's dope and we have a DJ and we have yummy food and it's all about healing and love and resistance, right? And all those good things. Um, and the next one is gonna be April 26th. So I'm actually planning for that right now. So when I get out of here, I gotta send some emails to figure out who we're gonna get for the catering, you know? Um, and the next part of that is going to be, uh, that project is doing the Geopoem project uh, where the poet winners, the we're going to, you know, map the poems and they're them re recording their poems on site because the poems are place-based. They write poems about specific places and how they connect to the community health. And so there's going to be the poem and then the audio recording of them on site um, that will be somehow in, embedded into a, um, a digital map. Um, I have other things in terms of pedagogy, creative things. I'm going to leave there because I really want to get uh, into a conversation. Um, but I will stop on this quote right here. I guess it's a good stopping point. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, that there was a quote from MLK, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, about this idea of a more convenient season, you know, that we got to wait, just wait, just wait, trying to dictate the pace and the urgency of pursuing health justice, right? Um, and then James Baldwin talks about this idea of time as well. Um, you probably heard the quote, you know, you've taken my mother's time, my father's time, my sister's and my brother's time, my niece's and my nephew's time. How much time do you want for your progress, right? How much time? I think about this, how much research? How much research, right? Um, and I'd leave with this quote here, I guess, because I feel like at the end of the day, we keep on talking about the things that we need to do, we need to do, we need to do, we need more of this, more of this, more of this. I think we already have what we have. Um, and we can't afford to be out here waiting for someone else to, to approve and say, yeah, yes, yeah, good enough now, right? There's no more convenient season. That's a myth. That's why it's a premise at its finest, right? We have to be the ones that have the audacity to try to make it over. Okay. Thank you. I'll stop. And mm -hmm. how about this? All right, thank you all for uh, joining us. Can you hear me okay? Great. So, um, I keep up? Okay. we'll uh, transition to our uh, TV set for this. Uh, for our engaging uh, fireside chat. We do actually have a fireplace in here, so I guess that counts. Right? <laughs> that's, that, that's what we could do at places like- I just dropped some fire, so there's- um, yeah. So we go way back. Um, we knew each other when we were master students at Michigan a long time ago. 
Um, the first question I have for you, which is, you know, I don't have the the creative powers that someone like you do, but I'm really um, impressed with you and have loved to see your career and your trajectory and the impact on the field of contributions you've made. Um, fortunately, I've been behind the scenes and some of the things that you mentioned up there um, and oh, being yeah. able to make um, decisions and make awards and things like that. So I've really appreciated your contributions and um, genuinely you know, I'm, I'm proud to see you doing what you're doing and, and trying to change the way that we think about um, public health and, and epistemology and theory and all that. So just want to give my thanks. Thank you. So, Thank you. Yeah, um, my, my hat's off to you. Um, so the first question I have, which is kind of awkward to answer, which is, you know, sitting in rooms like this, um, how do you do what you do with this without any scaffolding? So there's no blueprint for what you're doing. There's no guidepost. There's no evidence-based practice, which is a tenet of the Brown School, right? Evidence-based practice. Um, so how do you chart your path without that that evidence-based practice? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think that, um, I don't know, I think that for me, I think that, that I, I see evidence, right? I do, I, I do feel like there are signposts. I think that, unfortunately, they're not in our own field. Um, I think that for me, and that's why a lot of what I talked about was they're from fields and from folks of, that people have never read. Um, and I think that's one of the limitations of public health is that we think that we get, like we have the, the arrogance to be like, this is public health. We have a whole campaign, y'all, with those red stickers, y'all seen it? This is public health, right? Like we're, we're so arrogant and ignorant. And it's like, I think that for me that there are signposts. It's just that the folks that are currently running our field that are deciding on what's uh, what our accreditation guidelines are, see uh, what the competencies are for um, getting a degree or our curriculum requirements. Um, I just think that there is a lack of awareness that there are ways in which we can know and, and produce knowledge and take care of ourselves and move towards healing and all those things. But there's unfortunately, to your point, there, there's no evidence base because that's a that's a set of logics that our field uh, centers and kind of you know puts on a pedestal. But I feel like for me, those signposts are um, coming from Black creatives, Black feminist scholars, right? I think that Audre Lorde, for me, is the ultimate signpost and guide and evidence for our field, right? Um, not just like her essays, like poetry is a luxury, or poetry is not a luxury, but like the poem that I'll probably read later on this evening, A Litany for Survival. Like there's there's ways in which we have known um, the world of like of things that are relevant for health and healing and resistance that are beyond measurement um, in the sense that public health is trained and conditioned us, right? And so I think that... Um, for me, in terms of finding that scaffolding, I've had to look elsewhere. Um, now, I would say, um, and, you know, for undergrad, I actually went to the University of Virginia and with the intention of doing creative writing, but ended up not actually doing creative writing. Um, but by engaging philosophy literature, um, African American studies literature, Black studies literature, right, um, that's where I found that scaffolding, right. Um, and I think that our public health programs don't require engagements with those fields, uh, and they expect us to, to look for other forms of, of evidence-based practice, right. And so. I'd say like, yeah, like it's it's tough to find it just in public health uh, with a few exceptions, right? The, doc, the works of like Dr. Chandra Ford, Dr. Kamara Jones, um, uh, it's limited, you know, that type of scaffolding, but it exists. I think it's, like, it's upon us to go and find it or it's upon our program directors and our institutions to recognize that it's a part of what our training should require. Yeah, thank you for that thoughtful response. And, and I would just echo that, you know, the importance of reading broadly. So I think- yes, yeah. Reading outside of your discipline, especially if you're, no matter what level you are, undergrad, master students, doctoral students, and you always think you don't have the time, but mm -hmm. you've got to make time to expand your mind and, and acquire new knowledge, right? Yep. Because that's how you create new knowledge is acquiring yeah. new new perspectives, right? Yeah. I think there's so much in there, like the, the synthesis of it, right? It doesn't, we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to know all the things, right? But like being able to like have and uh, appreciate ideas from various spaces, right? And different disciplines, different forms, right? Art, music, film, right? And to be able to cite them in a, a research paper in a classroom, right? Like, yeah, I watch this documentary. I'm going to cite it. Like, I feel like there's something generative about that, right? Like giving ourselves permission to, to explore the boundaries of how we can produce knowledge and learn from each other in a way that I think we haven't traditionally allowed ourselves to do. Um, other question I have to start things off is your community. And so you mentioned your, your friends from back home and your family. I'm wondering how you sustain yourself in doing this work and, and knowing that, you know, being in these spaces can be weighty. Um, the community that you come from 
in addition to the spaces you're like infiltrating essentially how do you sustain yourself yeah that's a great question i know you work in this and you've written on these things right <laughs> um like it's tough being uh it is i think for a lot of us uh, i think that for me in my own social locations right it's definitely tough i'm first gen uh, african-american um I, I gave you all a little bit of my my background which i do in all my talks on purpose right because of my person I'm not an objective robot that's like, here's my science. I don't give those type of talks. If you want that type of talk, go on the internet and find it or something, right? But like, um, I'm a human, right? It's important that you know a part of who I am so you can understand how I'm seeing the world as I'm talking about the things I'm talking about, right? Um, but it is a challenge to be in these spaces, uh, predominantly white institutions. I went to University of Virginia, University of Michigan, and UC Berkeley. Um, and I think that I might have had um, one black male professor um, Derek Griffith, you know, Dr. Griffith at University of Michigan uh, all the time, and Dr. Jerome Nariagi too at Michigan, right? And then I was the only um, black male out of 98 in my cohort in my master's program. Uh, my homie, Dr. Yusuf Ransom, who's at Yale, was in the cohort behind me. Um, and then at Berkeley, I was at the cohorts, I was there for five years. There was like 35 uh, doctoral students, again, the only black male. Um, and then no black men as professors when I my, during my doctoral training, right? And that's partly why I choose to be in academia is to create space and hold space for that, right? But it is a challenge. And it's also especially a challenge because like, you know, we have lives that extend and that precede and extend far beyond our classroom and our research, right? Sometimes when we're doing this research, it's not like, it's not a third person. Like I'm, it, it's my own family, right? Um, it's my neighbors, it's my homies, right? Um, it's not like some data set, some anonymized rate, data set. Like when I'm doing an abolition project, like that's my younger brother, right? Uh, who's in county right now. So when I'm doing like a housing and security thing, that's not some random person that's like a welfare recipient. That's, that's my mom, right? So it's like one of those things where to be in these spaces, to know that we're out here trying to document and do research on these topics when they're so close to home, it's hard to find um, those spaces and places uh, where you can kind of retreat and have that refuge because there's not a whole lot of us that share that. And if there are, we think that we can't disclose those things because we're, melt to fit, we're, met, uh, we're made to feel that we don't belong in these institutions, these spaces, right? Um, so yeah, I think that uh, for me, um, finding a squad, um, I'm sure you found yours. A lot of us find ours, right? I mentored Dr. Uh, Laconte Dill and Dr. Shanae Birch. We do this poetry thing. I couldn't do it by myself. I wouldn't dare do it by myself. I, I, I wouldn't survive in a space without folks uh, like them, uh, like my homie Yusuf, who's way across the country from Portland, right? But we find ways, right? And I think the important thing is that we got to find a way to stay in this space as long as we can. Um, to, as Dr. Dill says, like, you know, open up all the doors and all the windows. Uh, so when we leave, other folks can kind of sneak in, you know? Yeah, thank you. Um, another question to build off of that is, and you mentioned this, um, something I always remind students as well, which is that there's people inside of those figures. There's people in every data table, every figure that you show. Um, anytime you're talking about numbers, you're talking about people and the live lives and the experiences they have. I think that's incredibly important. The other thing I think about with regard to data or what are data. Um, so from your perspective, especially having the interdisciplinary approach that you use, um, how would you answer that question? What are data? And then the second would be, how do you use data to make change? I'm sorry, I have responses to those questions. I don't have answers. I, tell, I say this all the time. I have a response. I have no answer. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, data, I think that, I think about data broadly, of course, right? And so I think we're accustomed in public health to think about data as something that, that like numbers usually, right? Um, and I think that obviously data and evidence are not the same thing. You can use various things um, as a part of your, you know, evidence claims, right? But I think that when we think of data in public health, it's usually like in the form of quantitative things, right? Uh, we often don't think about um, like an interview or a focus group um, description, uh, summary of that as data necessarily. Right? We might think about it as evidence, but we don't also use the word data to describe. Even though we say qualitative data analysis, when it comes down to policy discourse, we don't actually evoke any qualitative data analysis in our discussion of data that we might refer to it as evidence, right? Um, so I think that in public health folks are used to that, that element, right? Uh, for me, I think that data, um, as I as I put on the screen from Alexis Pauline Gums, like if you can read this, I am data. Like we're all data, right? Um, I think that it's a matter of how we frame our arguments and our claims about what we're trying to connect to and what we're trying to advance, right? And as a public health scholar who's also a creative, um, who real talk had no intentions of being in academia at all, right? Um, not when I was like going to college at all. I wasn't thinking about that life. Um, I think it's... Uh, 
data can be whatever we can leverage to to advance right like we don't we when we collect when we do research in science um like ultimately we have an intention right as much as public health wants to be like again neutral and apolitical none of us are here just randomly right we have an intention and so for me it's always important to start out with like what do we hope to see uh what do we want to like what are we hoping to change and impact there's nothing neutral about it like if you if you don't actually have an intention to do anything why are you here like stop pretending as if you're only doing this work just because you just want to geek out on data. And if that's the case, then that's cool, right? But I feel like we have an intention. We're trying to move something forward. And we can do that uh, in an unbiased fashion in the sense of like, we don't have to be like statistically like manipulating things. And like, we still do good, like, you know, we do still do good science, right? But we don't have to redu limit ourselves to one version of what data can or can't be, right? Um, I think about creative arts as a form of expression and knowledge communication, right? Whether or not I would say that that's data in and of itself, um, I don't really know. I have to marinate on that a little bit more, right? Um, but I think that any way in which we can show up and hold space and engage in that conversation, that can be a part of the data conversation for me, right? And so like a poem, as I like to say a lot, like odds ratios aren't going to save us. Uh, I don't know if a poem is either, but I know that I know how one makes me feel, right? And at the end of the day, that's all the data that I need to suggest that it belongs in our conversation. Thank you. Uh, the last question that I'll ask, and then I'll see if there's questions that um, students might want to pose, um, which is a lot of students at this stage of development, whether they're masters or undergrads or doctoral students, they're trying to think about what their careers are. They're trying to think about practicum experiences and their first jobs and whatnot. Some of them are looking for what I like to call an on-ramp. So on ramp to making a difference, um, on ramp to having an impactful career, making major contributions. It's a very broad question. I know I'm, I'm posing like super hard questions. Um, I wasn't ready for it's this. much easier to pose questions than pose to, to respond. <laughs> <laughs> but my last hard question is, um, what would you? What advice would you offer to people who are looking for that on ramp, like into making a difference? Oh mm, man, again, I don't, I don't have advice. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's a. I think it's unique to each situation, of course, right? Um, I, I I would say this though, um, and I was reminded of this just you know just yesterday, um, day before yesterday, I guess, um, uh, in a panel up at University of Michigan with Dr. Kamar Jones, Dr. Sean Ford, Dr. Monica McLemore, and conversation about, you know, keeping your statements, your personal statements and your, all those things uh, from undergrad, grad school, right? To see the ways in which your dreams or your ambitions, your direction has shifted or changed and looking at that to remind yourselves. I think sometimes, again, I mentioned earlier, it's kind of as a joke, but kind of serious that some of us are in this space accidentally and that's cool. We still love you. Um, but it's like, I think that not losing track of what got you into the work is probably the first part of like the the direction about how to find that on ramp to get to the next point, right? I think that what happens to so many of us is that we get in here, um, and I speak from a, my social locations and especially like being first gen, feeling like you don't really belong in a space really at all for most of your training, right? And so you're not really sure how social capital and things like that and connections and all that work, right? Um, but so we're able to be talked out of our dream, right? we're able to be moved off of our real passion and our real interest, right? We allow ourselves to basically what, you know, black feminist scholar um, Chrissy Dawson refers to as like epistemic quieting when like folks basically quiet our testimony. Um, and then we learn to smother our own testimony, epistemic smothering, where we learn that, okay, I probably shouldn't say the things I actually feel. I'm just going to like keep my mouth shut and be quiet and just go with the, the flow, right? That happens to so many of us, right? And so I think that one of the ways that can help us navigate that process um, so we can more, 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 um, so that our, the on-ramps that we're going to go look for or be able to be aware of, they're more aligned with how our dreams started. Because uh, sometimes we allow that to be corrupted and co-opted by the training process, right? You end up doing a, a project with a faculty member and you spend all your time doing that work and then you lost track of what even got you in, in, into the field to begin with, right? And the next thing you know, your on-ramp is doing more of that work and that's not even what you came here for. Um, so I think that that's one thing I'd say. I think other than that, I think just like leaving open the possibility that like maybe it's not public health work. Maybe it's not in academia. Um, some of y'all probably creatives already, right? Graphic design or filmmakers or whatever like that. Like I think that there are other ways to do health justice related work that don't look like the way you've read it in your classes. 
Uh, so give yourself permission to explore that. And you probably find some more on ramps that appreciate you and value you and make you feel like you belong than the traditional public health process. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that's a really good response. And I think it's a good segue to think about students and, and what might be on your mind. So I'll pause here and see if there's any questions from students who might like to pose questions to Professor Pedway. I feel like you've done this before. I feel like you've done this before. <laughs> I feel like we just we just started something. This is going to be a regular thing. You're going to have to have like these fireside chats with Dr. Hudson. Uh huh. Podcast, podcast. At least a podcast. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? It's good, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for thank you so much for the discussion. It was amazing. I, I really appreciate the work that you do, and the fact that um, you've gone out of your way to sort of criticize the norm, which has um, which has time and again proven that it wants people to conform uh, to whatever definition that it makes of itself, and also the fact that you push for people to have their own identity, uh, which may not be governed by what people may say or think, but their own personal experiences and stand by that. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, during your pursuit of such a career, uh, at what point did you start building your social circle uh, that would help you, that, or that would support you in moving this agenda forward? Because um, creatives, um, it's, not, it's not like, you, it's not, they're not as, as they, they may not be as, as commonly positioned in our field as we may think. And, um, the field that you selected is kind of, uh, it's a technical field, but then you decided to bring that creative mind space into it. How did that, how, how did you, how was your experience when it came to building a social circle to be able to push this uh, to the level that you've reached now? Yeah, thanks for that question. And it's spot on. I feel like this is exactly what it is. It's a uh, creatives and creative ways of thinking and knowing aren't really given space in our field, right? Because it is seen as a technical, um, and it is, right? And it's like, I don't want anything I said to be construed as like being like uh, a science or a scientific or anything like that. But I think that there's a broad range of knowledges and epistemologies that count as science, right? Um, but in terms of the creative things, yeah, I think that, um, I should say this, I, I, mentioned, I think I mentioned that I went to school to do creative writing, uh, ended up moving away from that. Um, but when I was up in Michigan, uh, when Dr. Hudson was up there, I did uh, a public health mixtape thing uh, where I created, like, I used to do, like, a lot of music. And so I created, like, this uh, nine-track, you know, seven-track mixtape. Uh, and one of the songs I did for that was a, a song uh, called Breathe about my younger brother's asthma. Um, and then loosely based on my family in Detroit and Toledo and the air quality and things of that nature. And so, and I recorded it. And my advisor at the time, Dr. Melissa Valerio, was like, this is, this is dope, this is incredible. You can use like hip hop to do like health communication messages for like asthma, essentially, because I was doing asthma research. Um, and so the fact that, and then she suggested to me that, you know what, we should see if the American Lung Association wants to incorporate this in their youth outreach, right? And that was the first time that someone had seen what I was doing and recognized the potential for it to have space, right? Because I was going to do it regardless. I was doing music way before I even knew what public health was, right? Um, but having somebody to see that um, to see that in me and to basically not give me permission, but to be like, oh, by the way, you should probably consider doing this, right? Uh, so I think that's kind of where it started with Dr. Melissa Valerio. And then I think that from there, um, I know that when I went to Berkeley, uh, I didn't know this until after the fact, but when I applied to the doctor program at Berkeley, um, I mentioned that I had an interest in creative things, right? And part of my statement was written as a five-part prose poem. And what I didn't know at the time was that Dr. Leconte Dill who was finishing up her doctorate was on a review committee that year and saw my statement formatted as a poem and was like, hell yeah, right? And then, so I feel like there's been these little, these moments at different spaces, right? Um, and others that I'm probably not aware of or not recalling right now that have signaled to me that this is doable, right? And then I think since those, I just shared those two examples, since then it's been more intentional. On the last four or five years, it has been trying to build a squad intentionally with Dr. Lacante Dill and Sinead Birch and others, right? And then I think that sharing it, right? So I'm doing a poetry reading later on. I think partly it's like we have to be, for the folks in this room that are creators, we just have to be more, um, we have to have the, the audacity sometimes, right? Um, and then once you find those one or two people, 
uh, allow them to be like that dream space, right? If nowhere else, find a few folks that you can just dream with, right? You don't want folks that are always looking at your paper, ready to edit and revise and, you know, show all comments and shit, you know, like, you don't want that. Sometimes you just want somebody to send your thing back and be like, I love it. Like, that's what you need sometimes. Thank you very much for a very uh, insightful presentation. Um, my question is twofold. The first one is how do we submit poems to your platform for review? I have um, a poem that is has it's more like a rhetorical themes in there. It's entitled Controversial Topic, Vagina's a Screamer, but not in the literal sense. Yes, so I'd like to know how do we submit? I'm interested to submit some pieces that I have. And um, secondly, my question is a little bit closer to what Raymond asked. Um, how do you operationalize your ideas? For instance, um, like I have poems that are kind of can be perceived as pushing boundaries. I have um, podcasts that I've recorded that um, are more like teaching aids, if you like, and uh, some little models here and there, like different pieces of things. As an artist, some of them more leaning to public health. So how do you operationalize those things? I mean, part of it I had like what you did, somebody had to find you and show interest in your work, but how do you operationalize those things so that you can now get into the space and start to actually intentionally have an audience and have people actually start to see your work and that impact in them? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, for the first one, for the journal, so it's health promotion practice um, and the poetry department. Uh, yeah, you just submit like a regular article. You know, there's a, you go to submit paper and you choose poetry for the public self. Um, and yeah, send it for sure. Uh, actually, I, I wish, I was, I was to say this though, I think we're closed for submissions right now, but we are going to be opening. Um, we have a backlog. We have some internal things that, you know, it's a, another conversation, you know, let's talk, let's talk about peer review publishing and capitalism and all the things when you have uh, journals that are owned by publishers and then you have three black creative scholars that are like, that doesn't feel like the way things should work. Um, you got to work through some things. But uh, yeah, so it's, you submit just like any other paper to the journal. Um, and then the other question, if I understood it correctly, um, I think that for me, in terms of like being able to defend it, it's just, okay. They get recorded, and then I can watch them later. Yeah. Right, it is okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, you know who that is. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um. I'm gonna need their address, their mama's address. Um, yeah, for the other uh, the other question, um, I think that for me, in my experience, I had to, I think I mentioned some of it, like sometimes like thinking about, um, at least what I heard in that question is like, how do you get folks to pay attention to the work and take it seriously as like, like public health related things and creating that space? Um, like for me, like I had to defend it by drawing on the field's own literature. Like, so I had to like literally go into the field and be like, well, y'all said this. So where's that at? You know, like, it's almost like you got to use the, the, the science of the field against itself and point out the contradictions, right? And for, as one example, the poem that I put, the bar chart poem, International Journal of Epi, it's like the number one Epi journal in the world. And the poem is basically talking shit about Epi. And I'm like, but that happened because of like this back and forth conversation with the editor. I was like, listen, like you said this, your journal says this. And then your reviewer and you and your comments about the poem, you say these things. And I had to point out the recursive logic. They're like, well, our readership won't be familiar with these concepts. And I'm like, why won't your readership be familiar with these concepts? Because you don't talk about these damn concepts. So you're using that as an excuse to not talk about the concepts again, right? That's what our field does. This is the issue with evidence base, right? There's a structure that creates evidence, and then we have to show that our current work is connected to the evidence base. But if the evidence base is designed by these logics, then there's no evidence that our new evidence could be considered evidence, right? 
And so sometimes you have to do that work of like manipulating um, the logics of the field against itself. And I feel like sometimes, I don't know how that necessarily would work in your case, but there's always a way that to make a claim for your poetry, for your art, that it belongs. I have found that I've had to go into the critical theory literature um, and like other scholarship to basically have the, the robust argument made for me um, to bring it into the public health literature because you won't find an argument in public health itself. I think we're right at time. All right. Um, really quick before everybody um, gives a very welcoming or a warm round of applause for this great talk. If you want more, there is more. Um, Ryan will be back today at 430 in this room to do a reading and um, to engage with all of us on, on thinking about how we can tap into that creative side of our brain. So um, if you want more, come back please at 4.30. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Petaway and Dr. Hudson for being here. Great conversation, everybody. Please help me. Thank, thank you. you.